Good evening to you. It is November 17th. It's about 624. We have about five and a half, just under six minutes until we begin our Bible study question and answer period for tonight. I pray that everyone is safe. I pray and hope that you had a wonderful day. I sincerely hope that you had a productive day and that you've braved through morning traffic, evening traffic, and you've made it home safe and sound with your family and all is well. For those that don't know me, my name is Rodney Smith Sr. I pastor New Hebrew Missionary Baptist Church. Well, God has blessed me to be now for over 14 years, and I cannot think of a better place to be with so great of a people. And so tonight we have a very good question, one that probably is somewhat repetitive, and that lets me know that it's definitely necessary. It's on more than one person's mind. So if you don't mind, when you log on to our stream tonight, if you don't mind just saying hello to everyone, saying good evening uh, to the members of New Hebron. Good to see all of you again. I see Sister Morris, uh, Deacon and Sister Davis, uh, Brother Jamario, uh, Brother Tidwell, my cousin Tanya. Thank you, Tanya, for what you did, uh, filling out the certificate for me. Uh, I'm seeing so many different people come on. It's just good to see you, good to have you, good to be with you. Sister Verdi Davis, God bless you as well. I'm glad to have all of you with us tonight. Certainly want to thank you for your support, even with your presence on tonight. Uh, I have an announcement I'm going to start with when we uh, begin with prayer. I have a, a very exciting announcement, some good news that I want to share with all of you put all this stuff up here. So I've got my coffee uh, on a night like tonight before we start Bible study. I've got my, I finished the huge container of Maxwell House and now I'm back to that strong Folgers again. Got my Folgers and I've been having to drink a little bit of water. I have not been dieting. I've been eating healthier and smarter. It's a difference. It's a difference. You know, I'll still run through a drive through or two but I make sure that I do the best thing I can in the morning and the evening, purchasing and buying healthier foods for the house. And another tip is drinking a whole bunch of this water. Do what I can while I can with what I have. So uh, go ahead and log on, make yourself comfortable. Sister Turner, good evening to you. Got some exciting news for tonight. So we're going to get started in just a few minutes. Hope everyone has had a wonderful day. It looks like Sister Verdi Davis said Folgers is the best. The best coffee personally I've had, now this is going to sound so crazy, is they've torn the gas station. It was this gas station, actually still up the street. It's at the intersection here of John Barrow and Canis. Conoco, or they've changed the name five or six times. I don't know what it is. I don't know what brand that coffee in that place where they sell wigs and hats and hot sauce and lottery tickets, that coffee is the best coffee I've had. I have no idea what brand it is. Listen, it may be Kroger brand, but for whatever reason, it is always made to perfection. Uh, I don't often get it because I always have coffee at home, but when I do, just some gas station coffee up the street does it for me. I don't do the I think Sister Ashley Brown called it a K cup, a little fancy stuff. I don't have all of that. So, to the Burnett family, God bless you. I pray you're doing well, you and your husband, Daryl. So, we're going to get started in just a few minutes. Uh, I'm excited about uh, the news I have to give to you. Oh, here we go. Excited about what God is uh, kind of doing for the church. I'm certainly sitting here. Got my notes and everything in front of me. Uh, something that we don't, uh, many people don't know, that this pandemic has really been uh, an awkward experience to adjust to. Uh, Reverend and Sister Austin, God bless you also. Sister Cheryl Brown, God bless you. It's been an, an, an awkward experience to adjust to. Uh, not hearing any response to your preaching, no amens or anything. Uh, I can think of Sister Marie Jordan. I can still hear her voice. No matter where she is in the church, I know exactly where she is. Uh, so, Sister Sandra Davis, God bless you. Uh, Sister Tamia Tim, the Tim's family, bless you also. But 
it has had blessings preaching and teaching and even pastoring during this pandemic. And that is, it has put in my estimation a laser focus on Bible teaching and Bible preaching. All of that handkerchief behind your ear, James Brown doing the splits, walking the pews, stuff and junk. You're going to look pretty foolish behind the camera, sitting down at the, the table trying to do all that nonsense. It's taken away from theatrics. It's taken away from emotionalism. And it's put a laser focus on what does the book say? Because you can't tune on here for some show, for some grandstanding, uh, for all kinds of other non-biblical rhetoric. When you tune in, you either want the Bible or you don't, period. That's all you have. And so I, I appreciate at least that part that has come from such an awkward and, and difficult time. And so I, I hope all of you have seen it. I hope you've been enjoying the time that we share in God's word. I love the Sunday school lessons. Uh, I love the sermon series. I love nights like tonight, our Bible study. Just a wonderful, wonderful opportunity that God has afforded us. So we've made it to 630. If you don't mind, if you can pause what you're doing, uh, if you don't mind, let's have a word of prayer and let's go down before the Lord uh, together. Uh, gracious God, uh, our Heavenly Father, before we begin to go through a list of things that we desire and would need your assistance for, we just want to tell you that we love you and we want to tell you thank you. Not for what you uh, are going to do for us, for we know that you're going to be good. We thank you for what you've already done for us, for the homes that you've restored, for the marriages that you've strengthened, for the broken relationships that you've brought together, for the peace that you have given, Father, for all these wonderful blessings, not even to mention the tangible things that you give to us. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done and for what you've been doing. I ask you tonight that as we go through your word, you can be the real teacher. Your spirit can impart your word into all of our hearts. To the end, our goal is that we can learn your word, live your word, and that you can get the glory from all that we do. We ask you this in the name of Jesus, and they all said amen, amen, and amen. So I'm going to dive right in uh, before we get to our Bible study tonight. This is involving Thanksgiving week. Next week is Thanksgiving. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, are going to be vacationing or just relaxing at home. Family is going to be traveling, so I pray everyone is safe uh, when you're on the road and that God protects you from the unattentive driver and otherwise bad drivers on the road if you do have to travel. But next week, because Thanksgiving thir is Thursday, Bible study, of course, would be Wednesday. We're not going to have Bible study next week. Now, that's not the good news. Uh, the good news is that there's an idea that I feel the Lord has put on my heart. Uh, and Monday, Monday, which is November the 22nd, Monday at 6.30 p.m., the same time we have Bible study, we're going to have a series I'm starting called Conversations with a Local Pastor. It's just a way to give a day in the life of, of a local pastor. Some people may not know the sacrifices, uh, the discipline. You may not know our study habits. You may not know decision-making practices, our prayer time and things of that nature. And so this is just a way to kind of peel back or pull back the curtain to give the members at large just a look into the life of a local pastor. You may go to a church where, you know, you may have a larger congregation. Uh, you can't just go talk to your pastor. You can't just call him on the phone. You can't just catch him after church because he jumps in the car and he's driven to another service and driven to a third service and driven here. You have to make a request with this person. So many people may be in that setting. You may not know what a pastor has to do, what responsibilities he has to maintain to, to be right with God. And so this is just a way to kind of give you a bird's eye view into the life of a pastor. And I'm going to be interviewing a local pastor. And drum roll, please. If I could do a drum roll, I'd be doing it right now. This Monday, 6.30 p.m., November 22nd, 
I'm going to take that time, that 30, 45 minute time period. I'm going to interview one of our own, Pastor Mario Timms. Amen. The pastor of New Hope Baptist Church. Uh, I've spoken with him. We've talked about it. Uh, he's excited. I'm excited. So we're going to be seated. We're going to both be recorded. And we're going to just have a conversation of some kind of general things that a pastor goes through, general things that a pastor endures. It's not some negative look. It's not some self-pity exercise, woe is me, look at me. But it's just an informative look to let people know who may not know. Here's what pastors go through. Some people are under the impression, well, all you do is get up there and talk for 30 minutes, man, come on. Well, eh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll look into all of these aspects. Uh, I don't know if it'll be monthly, bi-monthly, or quarterly. There's no set schedule, but I do want to continue it, and I thought there's none better to sit down, have a cup of coffee with, and discuss these things than one of our own. One of the sons of New Hebrew Missionary Baptist Church, Pastor Mario, is it D Tim? The D stands for "Don't you mess with me, Tim." But anyway, Mario Tim's is going to be our guest, and that's going to be Monday, this Monday coming up, November twenty second, six thirty p.m. Set your time, set your alarm. Let's be ready at that time. We'll log on early. We'll begin promptly as we do, uh, Lord willing, at six thirty. So. I was excited about that, excited about the news. Hopefully there's some information that any some of us uh, can learn that maybe we haven't known, maybe you haven't gone through. So please mark your calendars, be ready, be prepared. We will not have Bible study next week. Wednesday is the day before Thanksgiving, but we will have uh, begin a series of interviewing local pastors called Conversations with a local pastor and the inaugural guest is going to be the one and only Pastor Mario Timms. And so please be ready for that. He'll be here. He's excited. We've been speaking the last week or two about it. So I cannot wait for these things to begin. So amen, amen, and amen. I hope you all are ready for that. I hope that is uh, something exciting for you. So we're about five minutes in. Um, I want you to take your portions, your uh, manuscripts of God's word. We've got a couple of scriptures we're going to go over. I'll give you our Bible study theme, the question that we're going to look into from God's word tonight. But before we get there, mark your Bibles in Galatians chapter 2. Galatians 2. If not, you can write these down. We'll go to them in succession. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, that will be our second stop, and then we'll be in Numbers chapter 20. So I hope, you've get, I hope you have all of that. I'll repeat that again. Take your copy of God's Word and mark out, put a bookmark, Galatians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and Numbers, the Old Testament, chapter 20. Now, this is going to come under the study question tonight. It, it's, it's a long question, but I'm trying to condense it to make it practical, plain, understandable, is what does the Bible say about the temperament of a leader? What does the Bible say that God has his preferred leadership style? The question came kind of, I guess if, if I can read into it and read behind the lines, it comes kind of a question, just guessing, could be wrong, could be way off, but it may, it gave me the impression that someone may have a dogmatic, very stern, very uh, uh, difficult leader that they are serving under, and they're wondering, like, is this proper? Is it not proper? Am I just supposed to be humble? How do I handle this? So we're going to look in Galatians chapter 2. We're going to look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And then finally, we'll look in Numbers chapter 20. Now, to begin the study tonight, let me lay myself on the table. Let me lay myself on the line. Uh, this is, is, is very, this may sting, but this is true. This is not my truth versus someone else's truth. This is my testimony. Being called 
up until the Lord pulled me to New Hebron. I never served under a godly pastor. I served under two pastors. One, um, uh, a pastor in between, I forget what they're called, um, interim pastor. He may have been the most difficult of them all, and I'm not saying this in any way to cast aspersions on anyone's name. I'm only speaking factually, and I can only speak truth. I never served under a godly pastor. Not that I were perfect or am perfect, but I can tell you this. You can take a list of sin of what I experienced firsthand, not hearsay. If these sins were horses, you could feel a whole bunch of stables. And so I came out of that knowing what not to do, but still having to trust God on what to do. And let me just say this. To any church that may be suffering with bad leadership, immoral leadership, rough leadership, tough leadership, my heart goes out to you because there's really no winners in a situation like that. There's really no easy way to go through it. It's just a rough patch that God sovereignly has allowed for whatever reason, and my heart goes out to you. But I will say this to you to hold on to God's unchanging hand. Uh, to an associate minister who may be in that situation, having a difficult leader, I was put in awkward positions. And I wanted to remove ego, remove pride, but just honestly, I didn't want to be a fool. The type of stuff on a cold night when you're leaving some event and they'll pull the keys out their uh, pants or whatever. Hey, 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 preacher, pull my car around for me and my wife. And I'm fighting, first of all, well, am I supposed to do everything a pastor says? Well, I know I'm not supposed to do wrong, but is this wrong? It's certainly inconsiderate. And how do I display that? How do I relay that without being disrespectful but still saying, you know, I'm grown too. So I, I, I got all these things. Yeah, Pastor Haynes was, he was certainly my mentor. But I've got all these things in my head. It's like, and it's... And you have to answer and do it in a split second. And time is going on. You know, hey, 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 we're going out to eat. Hey, preacher, drive me and the other preachers to the, to the I'm like, drive y'all. Wait a minute. I, I'm not a chauffeur. So I'm only sharing these examples loosely, not too specifically, just to let you know I come from a difficult situation. And the negative that I experienced was God's blessing to me, which was this. Okay, I know what not to do. I may not know all the big picture of what to do, but I thank God I know what not to do. Now, what not to do does inform what to do in some ways. So that is my background. And one thing I do know, that when a church, and I hate to say this, but Lord, this is true. When a church has trouble with a pastor, you are in a difficult situation. Amen, Pastor Smith. I'll give it to myself. So I want to come into this Bible teaching, this Bible setting with God's word, knowing I've been there. Uh, I understand it. But there is hope. So let's, let's look at this. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11. Turn there with me. Get your portions of God's word. Galatians chapter 2. And we're going to look at verse 11. Galatians 2 and 11. Now I'm going to read this one verse, but then I will put it in the context because the, the further verses help bring it out. In Galatians 2 and 11, this is Paul. And Paul is writing now about the situation with Peter. Galatians 2 and 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Now, this is Paul. Paul said, listen, I had to take a direct approach and stop him for what he was doing because what he was doing was wrong. In essence, when you read further 12 and 13 and following, what Peter was doing was, here's an old Pine Bluff proverb, Peter was being two-faced. When the Jews were around, okay, he's acting friendly with the Jews. When the Gentiles were around, well, I don't know the Jews. I'm friends with the Gentiles. When the Jews came back around, he'd be friendly with the Jews. I don't like the Gentiles. And Paul 
who was called to be an apostle to the Gentile, one of his main mission was to bridge the gap between Jew and Gentile. Paul saw this as a roadblock, a stumbling block to unity in the church, to bringing those who are of the seed of Abraham and those who are not to bringing them together. And Paul said, this has got to stop. And Paul directly, Galatians chapter two, verse 11, I withstood him to the face. Now, we don't know what he said. We don't know how he responded. We don't know. I, I would doubt he lost Christian character. There's nothing he needs to repent of. But Paul directly had to take a bold stand against a fellow apostle. And I want to say this, that in leadership, you know, we, we were talking earlier about conversations with a local pastor, the pastor of a church, anyone who's over a particular ministry, a Christian in general, there does come a time to where we must have a certain level of boldness. It must be done. This tooth must be pulled. This bridge must be crossed. This sin must be pointed out. Irrespective of what it does to you, you are in a position of leadership. You are a responsible individual to God. You must have a certain level of boldness, not obnoxiousness, not being condescending, not demeaning, but you dare to do what is right. You dare to do what the Bible says. You dare to call out sin and sinners. And this is what Paul did to Peter. Now, 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 let's, let's keep in mind, Peter wasn't a slouch. Hey, Peter was not some passive individual. Peter was not the walking mat that you may think or may mistakenly think he was. This is Peter that took out a sword and cut off the ear of Malchus who came to arrest Jesus. This is Peter who would often speak before he would think and even try to keep Jesus from being crucified. And Christ had to say, Satan, get behind me. You don't know what you're talking about. This is Peter who is just as much of a man's man as the apostle Paul is. But yet Paul is not trying to stir up controversy. Paul is not trying to have a macho ego manhood contest. Paul is on the side of right. And Paul is saying, I must be bold enough to tell you that you are wrong. I love you. Peter, I love you. We're on the same team. We should have the same goal. You, what you are doing is causing division. It is not uh, inspiring unity. And just from this, there's a certain level of boldness that Christians must have. There's a certain level of boldness that the leader of churches must have. That does not mean you talk loud and proud and you walk hard and slam doors and you pull your slacks up to your armpit, reminding people who you are. No, no, no. But you just go ahead and do what God has called you to do, irrespective of the awkwardness of the situation. You can see how in a situation like this, that can cause a problem. Sometimes problems can come to Christians, and that includes Christian leaders of churches and laymen, whomever. But sometimes a certain level of trouble comes your way, not because you've done wrong, but because you've done right. Now, there's a text I want to refer you to. You don't have to turn there, but it's in Exodus chapter 32. It's verse 6, just the A portion. But in Exodus 32, as you recall, Moses comes down off the mountain. The people dancing naked. There's a golden calf. They've put Aaron in charge. They say, we don't know what happened to this Moses fellow. Come on, Aaron, you next in line. Let's get this thing hopping. Give us a God that we can see. And when Moses comes down, Moses is mad. Moses said, what, what in the world are y'all doing? And in Exodus chapter 32, verse 26, Moses stood at the gate of the camp. He sees this filthy, perverted, sinful scene. And Moses said, who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. He said, listen, all y'all that's going to do wrong, stay over there. But everybody that wants to be with me and follow the Lord, come on this side. 
We're making a clear, definite line in the sand between who's walking with God and who's against him. And as a leader, to take those stands against sin, as a leader, to take a stance against people you love, to do it lovingly, but yet still boldly, it must be done. And listen, there can be no favoritism. I can share a common goal, a common love, common likes, common dislikes with somebody, and they can share the same thing with me. And guess what? If they do something continually outside of scripture, I'm obligated by God to lovingly pull them to the side and tell them. Now, now here's the hard part. I'm going to use me personally. Whether you know it or not, it's, it's not anyone's business to make a spectacle. Hey, guess who I just had to talk to today? No. You wouldn't want that done to you, nor would I want anyone to do it to me. And guess what? It takes a certain level of boldness in you, Christian, to lovingly, biblically, privately speak with whomever it is and say, I love you, but what you're doing is not right. I tell you what, if you want to warm yourself up to it, start doing it on a family level. Talk to your aunts, your uncles, your cousins, your friends. Talk to them if they're older than you, like Paul said to Timothy, if they're older, like a mother or a father, if they're your age, give them the respect of speaking like a brother or a sister. The Bible never condones losing your composure, laying your religion down to get someone told out of malice or vengeance or revenge. No, 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 no. But there is a certain level of boldness we can see in Galatians chapter two, verse 11. It must be done. Has to be done to point out wrong, to correct out of love. Sometimes you don't want to do it, but you have to do it. You cannot turn a blind eye to this, but then hyper-focus on somebody else over there. It must be done equally. And guess what, people? On a leadership level, and I can say this as a pastor, just because you don't know what's happened don't mean it hadn't happened. Just because they haven't told you. Now, some people, when you lovingly correct them in private, they'll go and tell the whole church. Don't got nerve to talk to me, so-and-so. Huh, okay, I talk to you in private. You speak to people openly, but all right. But there are some people, they don't make a spectacle. There are some people who even in that moment or soon after, they say, you know what, you was right. I shouldn't have, or I should have. Oh, yeah, you right. You know, you, you know. That does happen, people. But there's a certain level of boldness that comes with leadership. But... Is that contained? How is that expressed? How is that given abroad? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at verse 7. Get your portions of God's word. 1 Thessalonians, the New Testament. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Oh, I went one book too short. 1 Thessalonians, turn to, turn to chapter 2, and look at verse 7. This is Paul saying, but we were, he's comparing his leadership style to others, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes her children or her young. And some people have a difficulty kind of connecting the two thoughts. Well, how can you be bold and gentle? Because you're gentle, but you still are courageous and bold enough to do what must be done. Just because you have to do something that requires a certain amount of courage, that could blow back on you, that could cause you to be disliked, that could cause you to be misunderstood, that could cause a problem, depending on who it is, that you have to boldly but still lovingly correct. Just because you do that doesn't mean you got to go in there slamming doors and walking hard, talking hard. He says here, we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes her children. And that word cherishes is a Greek word that means to warm. And Paul is giving a simile, comparing two things that are like. Paul is saying leadership of God's people is like a nursing mother that will use her own body heat to warm her young. So first of all, at the outset, this takes away from vengeance. This takes away from malice. 
This takes away from e any evil hidden motives. You don't have a certain level of joy when you have to go through this process. No more than the surgeon has joy when he comes out to a waiting family in the family room to tell them that their loved one didn't make it through surgery. No more than the army officer has joy when he has to deliver a flag to a family's home to say your loved one didn't come home from Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan. They were KIA killed in action or they're a prisoner of war or we don't know what happened or they were killed in some. No one has joy. The surgeon doesn't come out there playing James Brown greatest hits, popping corn nuts in his mouth. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your mama, she ain't going to be back no more. Y'all good? Y'all want the food? No. He's not careless or callous in that way, but they're gentle. They're warm. They watch their words. They're mindful of their body language. Their tone is one that is of respect and humility and love and consideration. Whether they know you or not, they know what I have to give you, the news I have to tell you. It's not news that's going to be pleasing, but yet they're bold enough to still do it. You see, your loved one, cannot tragically not make it through some surgery or there's some car wreck and they're trying to revive them and they couldn't be revived. Imagine the doctor, the surgeon, the nurse, the physician that's not bold enough to come tell the family. He just lets you sit out there because he's too scared to give you the bad news. Bad news in a way that would be tragic and hurtful or even bad news in a way that may upset some people. That's not the goal. And that's the tenor of what is talked about here. Paul is speaking with the mindset, just picture it, of sacrifice, of humility, of patience with God's people, of love to God's people. Now contrast, Paul is an apostle and Paul is a man of authority, but he always used his authority in love. And friend, let me tell you something. That is the beautiful mixture of godly leadership. Delegated authority, not diplomatic immunity, but delegated authority that is being exercised when necessary out of love. That's a far cry from the who you talking to. That's a far cry from the, we got two members, but still call my secretary, secretary, secretary to get to me. This grandiose posture that sometimes we've seen and maybe, hopefully not, but maybe some of you have experienced. That is not the design that God has for a leader. You must be humble, but you still must be bold. You must be kind, but when it comes to the Bible, you must be authoritative. And a part of, from my estimation, from my sample size experience of dealing with situations like this, haven't seen every situation, can't speak to everyone in every season they're in. But from my sample size experience, a part of the problem is that many church leaders do not know where their authority begins and ends. That is a major issue. That's what leads to the pastor in every little bit thing that honestly, they really have no authority. My authority as a pastor, your authority as a Christian begins and ends with the four corners of the Bible. If there is no book, chapter, and verse, there can be no mouth, teeth, and gum. I cannot speak authoritatively on who should cut the grass and what kind of grass the church should have. I cannot speak authoritatively on what color carpet to have and who's going to lay the carpet. I cannot speak authoritatively on who's going to fix the roof and what color to paint the walls and what shingles to use and what pitch the roof should be at. But I can speak authoritatively from the Bible on how the church is to raise money. I can speak authoritatively from the Bible on how the church should conduct itself when it comes together from worship. You see the difference here? If you don't know where your authority begins and ends, well, then you can push yourself into situations where you really have no authority. 
You can't tell somebody how much they're supposed to give, what neighborhood they need to move into, what uh, car they need to drive. I'm just throwing some arbitrary things out there. I'm not personally concerned if the choir that sits behind me in the choir loft, if they wear regular clothes or the choir robe. I like seeing the choir robe. They all unified. But if they want to do different color shirts, the same color shirt, I, listen, all these other things that are not covered in Scripture, we can come together. We can discuss it. We can look at what's practical. We can look at what's beneficial. We can look at what's wise versus unwise. But if somebody says, hey, listen, the church is behind on money, what we're going to do, we're going to do a cookie drive. We're going to start selling that, that world's finest chocolate. We're going to go to Asher University and hold out these church buckets and get the world to support ministry. No, ma'am, no, sir. The church is not to be supported by the free will giving of the culture. The church is to be supported, I can speak authoritatively, by the free will giving of the members. So you see the difference. So the difference is... Bold, meaning you may not want to do it, but you have to. Like a surgeon that has to go out and give this news and say they didn't make it. But you still must be gentle. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. Paul said, you know how we were among you, our leadership style. We were like a mother that would take her own body heat to warm her own nurse, nurse her own children, warm her own children. That's love. That's like a nursing hen. Uh, I've seen it in my mother in the chicken coop, how that she would just sit on those eggs. Or I've seen it when we had a dog. Uh, our German Shepherd Pepper had a litter, I remember, of 13 little uh, puppies. And she would just lay there and just feed them. And if somebody messed with them, don't you mess with a, 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 a dog's puppies. Oh, you're going to get, she would protect them. On that cold weather, they would nestle up under her. That's the type of love, sacrifice, humility, patience, endurance that God wants us to have as leaders. As it relates to domineering, dictatorship-like, condescending, obnoxious, bust you out, crude, demeaning, that is not found anywhere in Scripture. Finally, Numbers chapter 20. Please turn there. Numbers 20, verses 10, 11, and 12. I'm going to read these three verses. 10, 11, and 12. Numbers chapter 20, 10 through 12. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he, Moses, said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels. Must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, lifted his hand up in anger. And with his rod, he hit the rock twice. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beast also. Verse 12, and the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron. He said, y'all, let me holler at you for a second. Because... You believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel because of what you've done. Therefore, you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. God said, I'm putting you on the shelf. Now, this is Moses in a fit of the flesh getting mad. The people are constantly complaining they're constantly grumbling. If you add in context all of the other things they've done to him, done uh, to his family, said about his wife, the overt insults, the backhanded insults, the low blows, and it finally just came out. Man, I'm sick of these folks. I can't take it. I had enough. I can't take it. I'm sick of this. Come here. Doggone low down rebels. I'm sick of fetching y'all. Why? Get your own water. Why? I got to get their water. I'm sick of this mess. And God told him to speak to the rock. He didn't speak to the rock. He smote, King James Version, or he hit the rock. Not once, but twice. Directly contradicting what God instructed him to do. Now, God, because he's God, sovereignly and graciously still blessed the people with what they needed. They still had water. This was tons of water. 
water to feed over a million plus people and their beasts and animals? Lord, how much water can an oxen drink or how much water can a donkey drink? This was an abundant supply of water. God still did it. He didn't mistake the man for the moment. He didn't hurt the group at large because of his foolishness. So God gave the people, the people what they needed because he loved them. This was a band of people that complained constantly, but he still loved them. You can have a church of people that complain constantly, but he still loves you. You can be a chronic complainer, but he still loves you. He does not condone what you do. It could be he's trying to love you out your sin, even as we speak right now. That's the congregation. However, when it came to Moses, hey, Moses, let me holler at you. Because of what you did, it was rooted in unbelief. Yeah, it was anger, anger, but you didn't think I could do it, so you hit the rock. That's what you did last time. All right. You are now being put on the shelf. Well, what do you mean? Out of all these years of leading them, you will not be able to lead them into the land of Canaan. We find out later, Moses died, Joshua took the reins, and Joshua led them across the borders of Canaan. And they came across Jericho and Ai. But even before that, they came across you know, the Jordan River, all these things. So a person could say naturally in our human mind, well, God cut him some slack. I mean, what he dealt with versus what he did, I mean, that's a lot. Let me take you to a New Testament passage, and you'll know this by heart. To whom much is given, much is required. I sum all of that up with all these different verses. Old Testament, New Testament, Jesus talking, Paul and Peter, Paul speaking to the Thessalonians. I sum all of that up to at least give a portion of a crystallized picture of the leadership style that a local pastor should have, local or national. Anyone, some people have different temperaments. That's just normal. Some people are more confrontational than others. Some people are more laid back than others. But no matter how you operate emotionally or psychologically, it does not override the person of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. That's why, now, excuse me for saying this, but I'm going to say it. That's why it's foolish when people tend to lean more toward a zodiac sign than the fruit of the Spirit. Well, you know me, I'm a hothead. I, I, I'm a Scorpio. You know me, I can't forgive. I'm a whatever. Well, whatever sign, don't forgive. You know me, I have trouble trusting people. I'm a whatever, whatever. Well, what about the Holy Spirit? If, if you're a Christian now, if you're not a Christian, hey, you're going with your bad self. But if you are a Christian, the Holy Spirit shows itself, manifests itself. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, temperance. Above such, there is no law. Listen, when you were born according to some fictional chart that they used to put in a newspaper... When you were born and this little fancy chart that is not biblical, it does not override the work of the spirit, the person of the spirit working in your life. It does not override it. And so no matter how aggressive you may be, you still are going to be gentle. No matter how laid back you may be, you still are going to be bold. Why? Because God compels you to do these things and to be this way. So to any church that may not know this, any people that may not know this, this kind of sets a framework, at least gives a template to begin your own study of the type of leadership that should be given on any level, not just for a pastor, for the teacher of a class, for the leader of a group. This is, this is across the board. This is not just a set of teachings and scriptures for the person that's the main pastor of a church. It's for everybody. How you lead your kids. How you lead a home. How are you in the classroom if you teach in the public school district. How you handle friendship. It's for everyone. You don't just get to tear these pages out of your Bible. So that's the stuff for preachers. I ain't no preacher, so it ain't for me. No, that's for everyone. To be incorporated into all of our lives. But since the question was geared to a leadership, it certainly applies to those 
uh, whom God has chosen, selected, and allowed to be a servant leader over his people. Because we must remember at the end of the day, you all don't belong to me. I don't have a congregation. I don't have a church. I don't have deacons. I don't have a choir. I don't have ministry leaders. I, I have kids. <laughs> Other than that, that's it. So I'll say that, you know, you were bought with a price. And I, don't, I don't even belong to my own self. So, you know, we'll, we'll close with that. Hopefully, this time that we walk through the word, hopefully this was beneficial. Hopefully it did shed some light uh, on maybe some things you were unaware of. Hopefully it refreshed and fortified some things you already knew. So as we get prepared to uh, close, uh, I want to remind you again, of course, Lord willing, this Sunday, Sunday school at 930, morning message at 1045, Lord willing, the morning sermon series that we've been preaching through, the hard realities of serving the Lord. So we're going to have that prepared for you. And then, Lord willing, on that following Monday, November 22nd, 6.30 p.m., I'll have Pastor Mario Timms here with us, the pastor of New Hope Baptist Church, and we're going to start a series entitled Conversations with a Local Pastor. And he's going to be the inaugural guest, uh, the first guest, the inaugural guest, and he's going to uh, just have a conversation with me with a cup of coffee, and we're going to just ask him a few questions and kind of give people maybe some insight into the life and ministry of a pastor that up until this point you have not known or been made privy to. So I pray that all of you enjoyed yourself tonight. I pray that there was something from God's word that you learned uh, to the end that God receives all the praise, honor, and glory. God bless you. I appreciate your support tonight, and I pray to see you again soon.